Hello and welcome to the Aiden Mac Show. We have a lot to cover. We have amazing stories to share with you and I'm excited to bring them to you today. But before we delve into our topics, I'd like to apologize for having my show on hold. Uh, this has happened over the past three months due to interpreting issues. The, I had one interpreter that uh, faced an unexpected crisis who needed to take care of uh, her situation and was unable to do the voiceover. Then I had another interpreter who I thought things had worked out, but she wasn't able to do it, and that delayed it a little bit more. And then I had another interpreter who couldn't do the technological par part of the show. And then finally, I found another interpreter and that was a relief. We were able to work through the technology and it's a go. So I realized that I have four shows in the queue and today I have two more shows and that interpreter was going to be overwhelmed. So I decided to drop those other four shows and just pick out what's important and move on from there. So I apologize for the delay. It was an interpreting situation. Now I have a backup interpreter and it's um, we, things are, have improved. So I'm really happy to have that and I also like to thank a company that stepped forward to help pay for interpreters because that would give interpreters more incentive to take this job as opposed to another job. And they do need to be paid. They do earn a livelihood from interpreting, you know. So that's all worked out and I do want to apologize and we should be good moving forward. So now I'd like to talk to you about a very inspirational couple. This is older news, but I do want to share this with you and their relationship together. It was a special situation because one of the partners had become very sick and you'll see how, how rare of a situation this is with this couple. So here they are, Joey and Rory Feek and they're a couple, they sing country music, and they had met while they were singing. And unfortunately, Joey got cancer. It was cervic cervical cancer, and it was terminal, and she couldn't get any better. And her health declined, and she became worse and worse and worse. And she wanted to live, but it seemed that the cancer was too much for her. And a real poignant part of the story is her daughter, Indiana. Oh, she's so cute. And she has Down syndrome. And when I was reading about it, I saw that the mom, Joey, uh, taught her daughter sign language. She knew that her time was running out. And she taught her sign language. And it was wonderful, the signs that she was teaching her. And there is proof that sign language lessens frustration and as people are able to communicate through signs. So that was wonderful that Joey used it to teach her daughter and it was really nice. And here you can see the two of them dressing up, role play, they have the same wigs on, but Joey's time was running out. And it was a real struggle for her as her health became worse and worse. And her husband said um, to her, you know, this, you know, this was really hard. And she says, I, I feel like I'm going to go. Uh, it's getting close to the end. So they made a decision to end the treatment, to end the medication, and her health declined further. And here's a picture of them. It was a real sad time as her, as her life was ending. And she tried to get as much time as she could with her husband and with her daughter. And finally, she had passed on. And her husband was truly heartbroken. They had been together for a long time. And he was there for her. He supported her. He took care of her. And then she was gone. And who would, ha who would he have as his best friend anymore? And he had his daughter... Indiana and brought her home to Tennessee felt something was missing but he knew that he was always connected with Joey so Rory was there for his wife it's rare to see that there are so many men who leave when things become unmanageable 
and they, it just becomes too much for them and they leave and Rory's a great example of somebody who was there supported his wife whatever she needed and it's really beautiful it was a beautiful relationship and really I'm a sucker for romantic things so that's what I wanted to share with you so now my hot topic uh, I feel like I've just shared what a sucker I am for romantic things and you know I like to be a little tough so I'm just gonna change gears and talk about my hot topic for now so anyway so I wonder what my hot topic could be and there's a buzz all through the deaf community and this has been going on for a while you know the deaf community is so diverse there's so many different groups there's different races there's different backgrounds it's really amazing how diverse the deaf community is they have their own lives their own culture their own language it's really amazing how people come from birth and then they go throughout the world and they can with people who can hear and they can communicate in sign language and they survived in this greater world and really they made it through and it's not like people who are in the dark who just kind of plot along no there's they're aware they feel and you know it, it, and you have to understand it's not that sign language and people who use sign language are powerless and what happens is that people make decisions for us but really they don't know what's best for us they feel that we're powerless by making their decisions and it's very intrusive and that impression is not welcome so really the deaf community is beautiful their sign language is beautiful and it's a visual way of considering the world and hearing people think in a very auditorial way I mean, both are beautiful but I don't understand it it has to be oppressive to sign language and the deaf community is just fine the way they are they're productive they lead productive lives and they don't need the oppression from the hearing community Starkey hearing foundation they give out hearing aids and they focus prim primarily on the audiological portion of a person's life by trying to make them speak and talk but even with putting a hearing aid on someone it could make it could really cause a lot of emotional distress and hearing aids are just a tool that's it it's not like you have the hearing aid and people become smarter you have a hearing aid and it doesn't make their education any better it, it still can be oppressive by just teaching someone English and not ASL and just drawing the line at having a visual language uh, I mean having an auditorial language so it's really it's really inspirational porn and they're using celebrities to rake in the money and they're becoming wealthy well the deaf community is struggling and struggling they don't have jobs and they have like a hearing aid and I mean it just it just adds up so I feel enough is enough add ASL spread the knowledge sign language is great hearing aids are a tool and if people can hear on the side that's great but sign language that's the main point so I'm tired of those who sell hearing aids who advertise and only focus on the audiological component while brushing ASL to the side they don't need to fix people who are deaf it's so frustrating and that's what happened and enough is enough CAD the California Association of the Deaf they wanted to put a stop to this and they wrote down a letter and they have a very strong organization they said enough is enough this oppression is too much and students are suffering people are suffering they're not given enough information like the they're not given enough information to parents who have deaf children and they put the onus on the school and there's like a big mess and really enough is enough they need to put down information that's clear 
And part of that information that they are saying is that hearing aid is a tool and sign language is important. And Starkey, they're getting so much money. They are, I mean, if you investigate them, you know, they say a lot. They make a lot of money. And do you think they give money to the deaf schools for higher education and linguistics? They don't. What's that about? Make a profit out of us? Make a profit out of deaf people? Mm -mm. And NAD, you know, the National Association of the Deaf, well, unfortunately, they're taking a more laid back approach. It's a sticky situation. They're not becoming uh, such a strong outspoken force like uh, California Association of the Deaf is. The, the CAD decided that's it. We're just taking over. We want to make some progress. We want to show people that we can do it. And we hope NAD will follow. And I hope that they do. I hope that this brings this conversation to the forefront and not have so much treading on eggshells, treading lightly around the subject. I say we just go for it. We make our needs known loud and clear. So bravo, CAD. That's a great example for all of the rest of the states. And really, the rest of the states should follow what CAD is doing. It should become a whole. We should have full access to ASL and full access to our rights and full access to a job and whatever else we do. It's an opportunity as much as hearing people have opportunities. <clears throat> the Washington Post, they interviewed our favorite, guess who? Of course, I wonder if you can guess, Niall DeMarco. Oh, really? He really and truly has a deaf heart. He is, uh, he really shows us what it is to be in a deaf community, what deaf people can do, and children too. He does ASL, and it's important to be bilingual, ASL in English, and he spreads that message. He really works with the deaf children and, uh, you know, and children in language deprivation. And I was really surprised to see that word. And that was in the in the Post, Washington Post with Niall DeMarco. So they had put that down that, that he responded. So guess who responded to that? Alexander Graham Bell. They are a strong oral supporter and they prevent ASL. They make it um, illegal, you could say for parents to learn sign language, for people to learn sign language, and they prohibit sign language, and they just focus on an audiological component so that people who are deaf can be in the hearing world. And so they teach them to become hearing and live fulfilled lives. But that's what Alexander Graham Bell believed, but he spoke language, he spoke English, and that's what he was saying to be uh, elevated to his language. And what they felt was English was the only language because it had hearing, and you could hear it, and you could write it, and you could speak it. But sign language is its own language. And so, for example, Niall DeMarco, who was able to dance on Dancing from the Stars, he had a deaf family, he doesn't speak, and look at how successful he is. He was on America's Next Top Model. He beat out all the other contestants, and he was on Dancing with the Stars, and he's really a big deal. He did wonderful, and he is deaf, and he signs just fine. So Alexander Graham Bell, that organization, to respond, guess who responded? Meredith Sugar. And she responded to this article in the Post. And she said, ASL, oh, good job, ASL. Yes, you could do it. But ASL is on the decline and oralism is increasing and people need to use that path. And she mentioned about language deprivation. And that was in her article. And I said, oh, language deprivation, oh. And I said, well, I wonder what made her respond. And Marley Maitland, she was on Dancing with the Stars a while back. Uh, she had responded, and I said, oh, there you go. No wonder the Alexander Graham Bell Association responded. That made a lot of sense. And there it is. 
language deprivation. And it's a powerful word. Some people feel that that can't be right. But the Alexander Graham Bell Association put out there that no sign language, you shouldn't use sign language, you should only focus on audiological ways of communicating and it, they stole their language basically and parents weren't allowed to sign and they held back information about sign language. They, they didn't have bilingualism with ASL and English. Uh, it was really a lot. It should be a bilingual education. And our skills in speech reading and listening, they did that. They just focused on that. And they did some research on children with cochlear implants who had sign language and children who had cochlear implants without sign language and they, who are only studied in oral approach. And you know that first group of the children with cochlear implants and sign language outperformed that other group without sign. So I'm a real proponent of supporting sign language. I had an experience when I was six years old, my parents were told not to teach me sign, to only speak. And so that's what they did. And they said, oh, your speech is really wonderful. And the parents, my parents believed it. And could you imagine for two, three, four, five, six years, I didn't have any sign language? And there was a huge gap of missing information. And finally, when I learned how to sign, I felt like I could really learn. I was, I gathered a lot of information in that time and I learned about English and ASL. I was able to make connections. I was able to see that they were two different languages and things worked out well. And I had struggled with writing because I was deprived for six years in a language that I could understand. So when you see like I had told a person that I was I had a six year gap and they said yes that is a lot you know like babies are born and they can hear and parents can hear and parents right away start communicating with them and the children can hear they can hear other people even when they're sleeping they can hear all the sounds deaf babies with hearing parents the parents don't know what to do days and days and days go by and the parents are unsure maybe they bring them to the doctor and they get a surgery where they cut their scalp open and put uh, the uh, cochlear implant in and they're working on the mapping for the cochlear implant think about all that time that has elapsed where they're not having exposure to language and then finally maybe they get the hearing aid uh, and the cochlear implant working and then they go into sign language I mean oh I thought six years was a long time but even three months, if you lose an opportunity to expand on language, that's really a lost time. So a baby who can hear, who has hearing parents can gather that language, but a deaf baby, right? And let's say they're born to a deaf family, they're born with that language emotion, uh, immersion. They're born with people talking to them and aunts and uncles and grandparents and the whole family can communicate. But where is this problem? It's with hearing parents who are unsure about what to do with their deaf child. A cochlear implant is fine, but they need to start the process. And if they wait until they're older, it's too late and they have a language deprivation. This is a picture of Alexander Graham Bell, the father of oral education. And oh, really? He did a lot of damage to the deaf community, a lot of damage. And he thought hearing people were amazing. Oh, and people really look up to him because he invented the telephone. But how he made it was he was trying to find a device to speak with his wife who was deaf. And if it wasn't for deaf people, maybe we wouldn't have the telephone invented. I mean, maybe it would be invented later, but who knows? But Again, it was a device for deaf people. People think that he invented the phone, but he really didn't. Alexander Graham Bell, he was really afraid of deaf people. They supported isolating them. They didn't feel that they could have advanced lives, but we can. The deaf, they wanted deaf people to be socially isolated. 
They wanted to stop them from marrying. They wanted to sterilize them because they were concerned that deaf people would have deaf children. And that's just uh, too much. And his wife, can you imagine Alexander Graham Bell had a wife who was deaf and she did not learn sign language. She just kept her hands to her side and spoke and maybe felt somebody's neck to figure out what they were saying. And, but she did not learn any sign language. And could you imagine having your hand slapped for not knowing any, for not being able to sign? So uh, in, in the 1880s, it was the Milan Con Congress, and it was a very dark, very much a dark age for the deaf community. They did not allow any ASL, any, any sign language, it, no matter what country you're in at all, because all languages, all American silent, all languages in the country, all people have different languages based on sign language. But what had happened was after the 1880s, people were not allowed to sign and they were punished for it. And what happened was the deaf education declined, it destroyed our communities, and really the deaf community is functioning fine without this intrusion from uh, an oralistic way of thinking and not using sign language and they just wanted to throw it away so really the the goal is almost like a eugenics is to wipe it out it's like a wipe out human variation and just have everybody be hearing everybody speak that's what I believe so Alexander Graham Bell is not our friend I'm letting you know this is what speech reading looks like. You see this young boy with a candle and he's trying to, they would have a taught letter P and B and C and they would watch the candle flicker so that you will know that you're making the right sound. And could you imagine doing this over and over and over again and that's it? And then imagine a class where sign language is used fluently, all of the information that's learned here. But here these people who are learning speech reading are just focusing on one sound to say it correctly? I mean, imagine all of the exposure to language and information that they would have if they could sign. And this is another way of they would have the headphones on and they would practice in a mirror and they would hold their tongue down and move their cheeks a certain way and move their lips a certain way. And I mean, it's really what we do with speech reading. And this is what people learn and they're brainwashed and practiced over and over again to be like a hearing person. Oh, please. And you see, this is a picture of Alexander Graham Bell and his wife and two children, but they refused to sign. They just spoke. That's what they were taught. And um, Alexander Graham Bell, his wife, her father was a rich lawyer and gave a lot of money to set up uh, Alexander Graham Bell. So now I also noticed this happening out in the community that oralism is bad for us. They are depriving us of a language. In the past when I was little I remember trying to communicate with my mom and I couldn't speak and I couldn't understand. I'm deaf. I was born deaf. And I couldn't understand, and the communication was really hard. We went back and forth, and it was frustrating. It's scary enough. Can you imagine being able to communicate and growing up? It's scary enough. However, if you have no way of communicating or a limited way of communicating or a frustrated way of communicating, can you imagine that so many deaf people have to go through that? There was a story I never forgot. I remember when I was a little girl and I was in class and I saw another little girl trying to sign. She was trying to express how upset she was. And I remember I saw the teacher come over and grab her hands and hold her hands behind her back. And she's crying and screaming and she's trying to explain what was going on. The teacher held her hands behind her back, prohibiting her from, from signing. I couldn't believe how 
easy it was for somebody to control our language. And can you imagine that is out in the world? I think that PSD and oralism is connected. Um, and I think that Alexander Graham Bell really touched our raw wounds. And that problem has not stopped. It has not gone away. It's repeated, like in this letter that's just tossed out, that prevents the rest of the world from seeing how wonderful sign language is. And we are really strong, and we are a, a great community that has a strong presence, but because of the situation, it is so raw. And I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking it's PSD. And I think that some research needs to be done. I think that we need to delve more deeply into this topic because it really is unfortunate to see this today. And it seems that Alexander Graham Bell Association has flipped the tables and they say, see, look at all these deaf people. They're protesting and ASL and they're forcing everyone to do ASL. But really, it's the oralists, it's Alexander Graham Bell that has forced us forced our deaf education. They blame us. However, I think that we're being scapegoated and it really is unfortunate. But again, I want to thank Niall DeMarco for a great job of representing our community, that he became our voice in sign language and he is a great role model showing hearing people, hearing parents, there is a way that we have to dispel all the old myths, all the wrong information, all the concepts about deaf people and just start fresh and start on a norm because they have a normal life and it's really wonderful and I'm really proud of Niall that he helped us and he's a great model for us that we can really grow. And I really appreciate him for being a representative of our community. So thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.